I'm going to be talking to Dr. Alex Holland, who's a senior technology analyst with ID Tech X in the UK. And he has uh, recently uh, co authored a report, Advanced Lithium Ion and Beyond Lithium Batteries 2022 to 2032 Technologies, Players, Trends, and Markets. It's all about alternative chemistries and applications other than lithium ion. So, welcome to the interview, Alex. Thank you, Mark. Happy to well, be here. Look, Let's uh, let's start with an overview of your uh, study, if you don't mind. Yeah, so um, at ID Tech X, we're uh, you know, a market research and consulting company, and the report really is looking at um, all the developments that are taking place, both within the lithium ion technology space, how it moves forward uh, within you know, lithium technology itself, but then also looking a little bit beyond that. Um, things like lithium sulfur, sodium ion, um, redox flow batteries, you know, you have almost unlimited choices with regards to battery chemistries, but really trying to look at what's actually happening, um, where these battery chemistries are going, where they might be useful, so on and so forth, and how they compare to the to the standard, to the incumbent. Now, my, my perception of this as a non-battery expert is that the, the need for storage has grown so, has grown exponentially. And what's happened is that a number of these uh, new tech, uh, new chemistries have emerged for some, in many cases, niche applications or specialty applications where they actually are, they're cheaper than lithium ion or they offer some other advantage. advantage. It, would that be a, a, a correct way to look at it? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest way to understand this is obviously the big growth in lithium ion demand is going to come from electric vehicles, but there are a bunch of other applications. Uh, I think stationary uh, is mentioned kind of in the report. Uh, so stationary storage systems where lithium ion doesn't necessarily hold um, the biggest advantage for that EV sector. It probably does for the most part. But outside of EVs, where energy density in particular, or sometimes some other performance characteristics aren't at the forefront, you can afford to make use of some of these different chemistries. Um, so I've noted, yeah, stationary storage, but you can think about kind of um, wearable technologies or medical devices where you maybe have alternatives to lithium, um, maybe some kind of you know, military or drone applications where you're maybe looking at kind of more advanced technologies as well. When you talk about uh, stationary storage, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is utility scale uh, storage. Sure. But uh, could we be talking about other applications like uh, residential, uh, you know, stick a, a battery in your garage or in the basement of your house, uh, commercial buildings? We're seeing a lot of it, particularly in the US, we're seeing a lot of a growth of uh, distributed energy. You know, uh, people are putting oh. solar panels, uh, buildings are putting solar panels up, in some cases, even w uh, uh, wind turbines, if they're a big enough operation. And then that seems like a, na a natural application then for stationary storage with these, perhaps these other chemistries. Sure. So, yeah, obviously, stationary, is, as, as you kind of point out, is a very broad um, classification. Sorry about the, the plane going overhead just now. Um, for residential applications, uh, it's likely that lithium iron will probably remain the go-to tech. Consumers will trust it. It's it's available. Um, the vendors are there. You know, the warranties are available, so on and so forth, and kind of the performance is trusted. There are there are options. There have been attempts from um, flow battery companies to to get into kind of that residential space um, in Australia, for example, with a, a zinc bromide uh, chemistry. Um, and you can foresee some application maybe for kind of sodium based chemistries in those uh, commercial uh, settings as well. Um, but you do have to be careful again if you're looking at residential or some commercial settings, you know, aerial footprint is still important. So you don't want to be taking up too much space. And there, of course, you know, lithium ion holds uh, the big advantage being a high energy density battery. If you're looking outside of there, as you mentioned, towards larger scale, grid scale, off-grid, um, co-location with, with solar plants or wind turbines or whatever it is, then you, I think you really do start to open up opportunities for these alternative chemistries because you have that space to play with and because you're looking at trying to hopefully bring down costs, take away some of the demand for lithium materials, which may become problematic. Uh, and there may be, you know, performance characteristics that are beneficial. You might get higher cycle life, for example, um, which might be beneficial for these uh, larger scale storage systems. 
Now, I've been hearing about uh, redox uh, flow batteries for a long time now, and uh, it looks, is, are flow batteries uh, sort of coming of age? Hopefully, yes. And we we think, you know, within the next kind of five, or six years, there's there, there are a lot of companies out there kind of in the US, uh, in, in Europe in particular, but also in Asia who are looking at uh, flow batteries, primarily vanadium based systems um, and they're relatively well developed they're understood they're, they're commercially available um, there are some there, there is activity still going on there kind of commercially trying to make it cheap or trying to make it more palatable with, with regards to kind of capital costs so looking at maybe leasing the vanadium because it's more easily uh, recycled that electrolyte system is more easily recycled um, and then you've got as I mentioned, you've really got you know a bunch of different chemistries uh, utilizing zinc, which can hopefully be cheaper. Utilizing iron again, hopefully being cheaper. Utilizing even kind of organic molecules. Um, that's a much earlier stage of development, but you've got a lot of options with with tailoring that electrolyte system to hopefully improve uh, cost. Uh, and we see that you know we see redox flow batteries as being actually yeah, very well suited to these large scale um, installations. And so over the next kind of five years, we, we, we're forecasting that flow batteries are going to start um, encroaching on you know a, a market which has to date been dominated by by lithium based batteries. Now we're we're also seeing uh, quite a uh, innovation within the lithium ion uh, technology. Where, for instance, new anode materials, uh, solid sure. state will be coming. Iron and sulfide being used. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Sure. So a lot of the almost you know looking at completely the other end of the spectrum. Um, you know when comparing stationary storage systems to developments to lithium ion is that a lot of the development for lithium ion is focused on you know improving performance so improving energy density improving cost getting fast charge capability so on and so forth uh you mentioned the anode i think that's particularly that's where you're going to get a lot of the performance benefit uh, you will still see tweaks to the cathode but those tweaks are are driven a lot by kind of um desire to to reduce costs to, to mitigate supply chain risks around things like nickel and cobalt whereas at the anode you've got i think two big trends uh, the move towards um, moving away from graphite and towards using silicon uh, and again similarly moving away from graphite as well and in, in conjunction moving towards lithium metal uh, and because both silicon and lithium metal ultimately can store a lot more lithium per, per unit volume or per unit weight um, that ultimately means you can get, you know, up to 50%, even more uh, increase in energy density for that lithium ion cell. Um, so that's, you know, really exciting kind of developments we see happening uh, again over the next kind of five years. If, if I were going to wrap up this conversation, Alex, I, I would say that it looks like uh, the 2020s are going to be the big, the battery decade. Uh, the, the tremendous innovation, uh, Costs are coming down, you know, at a, at a pretty rapid rate. Uh, all of these new chemistries moving into niche uh, niche markets, uh, improvements is scaling up uh, of production. Uh, are we likely to look back from 2030 on you know the early 2020s and I guess through the whole decade and and you know this is the this is the sort of key decade uh, for the development and and diffusion of these ba battery technology. Sure. I mean, from where I'm sitting, from where we're sitting, we would say so, uh, both within the lithium ion space to really help drive that adoption of electric vehicles. I think there's a lot of exciting innovation happening and those are going to be commercialized. And then again, on the other side for the alternatives, as you say, um, the, you know, the market is going to be smaller, absolutely. And it's going to be it's going to start off in smaller markets, niche markets. But again, I think we are going to see that diversification of batch chemistries being utilized. Um, and I think if we look to, to look back on the 2020s, hopefully in 10 years' time, I think you will have seen um, that, that story pan out. Great. Alex, I uh, always appreciate your insights. Good talking to you again. Uh, thank you very much. Cheers. No worries. Thank you.